Aventurina, since you went to China, you became a well-known TV host. You've become this conduit between China and Western cultures, and you've become quite an expert on Chinese language. And you did it all in the moment. You learned it all on the spot. If you could describe yourself in one word, what would it be? Climber. I'm a climber. Because I think the road to having the courage to just being yourself, sometimes it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill climb. Aventurina King was born in Paris, France, to a British father and American mother. Frequent visits to Paris's Chinatown and studying Kung Fu instigated her interest in Chinese culture and language, which she studied and discovered she had a knack for at Columbia University. Afterwards, she followed her heart in a rather unexpected way straight to China, where she would eventually realize the healing power of a new set of cultural values. Aventurina, your international experience actually predates your going to China. So tell me a little bit about how and where you grew up. I was born in Paris, in uh, Chinatown, which is a twist of fate. Yeah. And, um, and then I spent my childhood in, in, in France until I was uh, 17. My father is British, my mother's American. They met in Paris, which is la romance, and uh, fell in love there, and therefore they had me. And uh, then, when I was 17, I, I then went to college in the States, and uh, right after college, I moved to China. Wow, so I was going to ask you about your college experience, but I kind of want to backtrack. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in Chinatown. Have you always, always had this sort of interest in China because of where you grew up, or did that come later? Well, I grew up, I, I was born in Chinatown, oh, but I grew up outside of Paris, okay. um, because Paris is very expensive. And, um, but I often went to Chinatown because there they had the cheapest vegetables, and my mother was like, you know, into saving money. So, and that definitely had to do with it. Every time I went to Chinatown, you would see these Chinese characters. And they were so beautiful, and then yet so mysterious. I always, I always wondered, you know, I, I always wanted, had this fascination with China and with learning about this culture and these characters. And um, and then when I was in high school, I, um, I, I, I was, I was tired of ballet, so my mom said, well, you have to be do a physical sport. So I said, okay, kung fu. So that's how I got into the whole Chinese culture thing. And there were a lot of Chinese people taking kung fu. So I, um, so from there, I, uh, I got even more interested in the culture. And when I got to college, I was like, this is my big break. I can finally study Chinese. And that's when it all began. What mm -hmm. made you pick Columbia to start your studies at? It was really a feeling. I just got onto the Columbia campus, and I felt like home. So I, I applied early um, because they have a very, it, it's really difficult to get in. Um, so I applied early. I was an early applicant. And I think the, um, I think they're slightly more lenient on uh, <laughs> People international, <laughs> you know, who, who I, I grew up in France. I had a background, so I think I, I think I got in that way, and um, and they happen to just have a super Chinese department. So you already sort of had an interest in learning about Chinese, so it's not as though it was a totally big shock to you to start doing it. But when you first started taking the class, what was your first experience of Chinese life? Did you find it difficult? Was it as amazing as you thought it would be? Like, what, what were your first impressions oh, of Chinese language? It was even better than I thought it was going to be. Um, it was actually really funny because uh, literally after the first class, like I think 50% of the students just went whoosh, not taking this class anymore. Because it's really, I, I don't know if you've experienced that. I, I have actually, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, you have experienced it. Like, just watched them all go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like the, the class is full one day and you come in the next and there's like, oh, where did everybody go? Um, it's like you're a survivor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a, you know, survivor. Um, so the, so, but, I think what um, what made the difference was, off the bat, I was very interested in Chinese characters, and and I had this great learning tool, which was a website called um, Zhongwen Zhongwen dot com, and it was basically you could input a character and it would give you the history of the character and like what it had evolved from, what the different parts of the character meant, you know. Um, so that was so so that was really big help in in the sense that it wasn't just rote memorization for me. It was actually, for example, we had the Ni Hao. The character for Hao is like uh, good, right? It's, uh, it's a child and uh, a mother, or a child and a woman together. That's the symbol in Chinese of good. It's like the family is reunited. So, I, so every time I saw the character on a test, I was like, oh, I know this. Homework was intense, but because of that, you know, I could make it fun. 
So did you ever imagine that you would become as immersed in Chinese language and culture as you are now? No, no. It's been um, it's 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 been a surprise how far it's you know it's taken me. Um, it's been I, I feel like I have a whole alternate life, you know, in China. Um, it's been an amazing amazing experience. You already had this attraction to the language, which you just described from the characters and the stories you could create. So. Um, if you can elaborate more also on Chinese culture, what you found attractive about that, mm -hmm. and how that's changed or developed uh, today now that you've had this whole in-depth uh, experience. When I got to China, it completely changed because I moved to China for, for love. I fell in love with a, a Chinese man, and, uh, and, and, and I had been heartbroken many times <laughs> over here in the U.S. And so finally, I came to China, and I discovered a culture where they value, you know, they, 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 they value love, they value the path towards marriage, they value having a family, they value your relationship with your parents. They brought you up, they gave you everything, they're your parents, so be good to them. Um, so that really, really changed, I mean, I had a very, uh, a bit of a tenuous relationship with my mother and my father. Spending a few years in China totally cured that. You know, I had a conversation last week with a friend of mine who's also studying Chinese mm -hmm. and Asian culture, and she was saying that she noticed in a lot of her friends and colleagues that a lot of people who come from that kind of background where family is sort of a, an issue or a question are very attracted to Chinese or yeah, Asian culture. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, because I have a lot of girlfriends in China who are foreign. They all have problematic familiar backgrounds and they you know we so we all have a lot in common but you and learn a lot you learn a lot and I don't know why China somehow heals you it's difficult to it's difficult to express like I know what you, mean. you know what I mean yeah like some people and and I and I hear this all along some foreigners go to China and they either hate it or they love it and you meet foreigners who are like oh my god the, the pollution the streets are so dirty the blah 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 and then you meet foreigners who are like but the food the friends the everything but you know it's very but from I think so I think I needed that I needed and it really healed me and um, and my relationship really healed me I'm, I'm so grateful for you know everything that was given to me through that experience Call it fate, call it luck, pure accident thrust Aventurina into the world of hosting when she turned up for a casting call for Hunan TV that she thought was for a singing gig. Aventurina was unexpectedly selected for her first television hosting job. However, she immediately found herself struggling with the job, the language barrier, and stylistic differences in the Chinese workplace. Determined to stick with it, she continued to find ways to stay active and interested in Chinese, learned to read between the lines of Chinese showbiz formalities, and began to hone her unique identity as a host. Now, she is praised for her fluency in Chinese, and doesn't let setbacks distract her from her goals. When I moved for my, uh, my boyfriend at the time, I, um, I just fell right into hosting. He was a choreographer, he was a dancer, he had contacts in the industry. And uh, one of the TV stations, Hunan TV, was uh, looking for hosts at that point. And I just went to, I thought it was a singing gig, because I was interested in singing. I just went and I was like, oh, I want to be a singer. And they were like, um, no, this is for hosting. And uh, I came in, and I, it was so funny. I walked into the hotel room, and I saw a pile of like carefully compiled albums of every single host that had been there to give their resume, because I didn't know Hunan TV is one of the biggest TV stations in China. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And so the director was like, so where's your resume? And I was like, for what? Like, I just came here, I would have been a singer. Like, he's like, no, this is for hosting. And I'm like, oh. He's like, do you want to be a host? I'm like, I guess. <laughs> and, um, and we sort of got talking, and I thought it was just like, hmm. But two days later, they called me and they said, we're going to fly you down. And uh, that's when it started. So what happened after that? You got I a call over, back. I flew over there. I, uh, I was, I, my trajectory has been so lucky. They, they were, this was the producer for one of their local stations, the smaller stations. And in, in China, the way it works is that you have regional satellite stations, and then under them, you have little smaller local stations. So I was interviewing for a local station gig. Um, and 
I started doing a show for a local station and it, it didn't work out. I wasn't at all good. Every day I was filming I would just cry because I couldn't say anything, I couldn't express anything, I wasn't funny, I was awkward. Everybody on the internet was saying, what is she doing here? Get her off this show, this is horrible. How do you push through after that? I mean, you had this experience TV hosting, like you, you're reading the response, it's not positive, you're getting yeah. kicked off these shows, like how do you keep going? What's making you stick to this? I have to be very thankful to my ex. Every time I was like, oh, I'm never ever going to make it, this is really bad. He's like, no, stick with it. You can do it. It's just a matter of time. And it's, and it's I mean, in the industry, it, it, it takes, they say for a host to become even mildly good, it takes five years. Five years is like the minimum. And then 10 years, 10 years is like the, maybe you can be famous in 10 years, like by 10 years. It's like the fastest to be famous is 10 years. That's just the, the automatic industry standard. What advice would you offer people who want to become fluent in Chinese? Well, uh, the best advice I can offer is to find a way to make it interesting for you. So I, um, it doesn't matter if it's calligraphy, it doesn't matter if it's Chinese songs. Um, and other than that, try to spend time in China. And then what I used to do uh, w before I would sleep every day was just listen to the radio and fall asleep listening to Chinese radio. And that's that uh, a lot of people I think have been amazed by the one, the one thing people have most been amazed by are, are, you know, my tones and my rhythm is very Chinese. And I think I attribute that to, um, what was it, Voice of America, I think, in Chinese. I would just listen to that before going to sleep, sleep on that, not understand it, not understand it at all. But I think just having that sound and that music in the background is what helped me. Even if you're not that fluent, I think that, in my experience, Chinese have been very friendly and welcoming, generally very, speaking, very to foreigners, welcoming. and especially if you speak some Chinese and know something about, you know, if you know even a little oh, bit about the culture, yeah, yeah. people are just, they, they welcome you with open arms, and it's a really wonderful experience. Yeah. But that's not to say that there aren't misunderstandings and cultural differences. Ooh, ooh. So based on your experience, what advice do you offer people who want to work in China? I mean, even though in some ways you're very welcomed, there's going to be differences and there are going to be struggles like what you mentioned. So what advice do you wow. offer in that regard? The main complaint I get from Chinese people about foreigners working in China are they're so angry and direct. And when they're not happy about something, they come storming in. So I think the first thing is when you get angry, take a step back and always try to think about it from the other person's point of view. What are your favorite things about China that you just can't get anywhere else? Wow, well, food. You cannot, I cannot stress this enough. There is no Chinese food outside of China. It just doesn't, I mean, Peking duck, jajangmian. I love horseback riding in Mongolia. Wow. Mongolia, like the steps of inner Mongolia, they just like go on for miles. And then you're on the horse and you're like, I, I sometimes I, I do horse races with the Mongols over there, and I and I, I sleep with them in their Wait, little I'm huts. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, because that's my, that's my idea of a vacation: is going to a place with no bathroom, no running water, and no electricity, and just sleeping on there and like sleeping there for four days and horseback riding for six hours every day with my favorite horse. That's like, oh, I love that, and like you feel like you're. It's something I've never experienced anywhere else in the world. It's just you can't see. There's like no horizon. It's just it goes on and on and on, and it's like this feeling of freedom. That's like amazing, and um, I don't know. It, it, China is such a big country. There's a wealth of experiences and ways of living, and I've, yeah. Oh, my life has been awesome. So, what was the hardest thing actually about adjusting to China, if, if anything, or did it well, come really naturally? Or no, it was really difficult. I think what we're talking about with the with the company things. I think, I think people, you know, Chinese, and it is true, Chinese. Chinese people, if there's an unsettling truth, they will not tell it to you. If the unsettling truth is like, we don't like you, you're not good for this show, they'll be like, oh, you're amazing, we love you, we'll call you like in a, in a day, you're going to come on this show. And that'll mean, sorry, sweetie. <laughs> you know? it's something misleading if you haven't learned about that. Yeah, it's very, it's very. So, so you know, now when I go for auditions or, or things with them, um, with 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 Poppy, my 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 uh, my, my agent, we have um, we have a saying. Poppy says, "Well, we're just we're just going there to make friends." Yeah, we're just going there to make friends because everybody's like, "Oh my God, this is so awesome! You're going to be on our show," and we never hear back from them. So we just uh, make friends. This is good. Tell me a little more about your experience with other foreigners working in the same industry as you in Ooh, China. Oh wow! At first, I was just there and and doing this because I was me because I'm a foreign girl who can speak a little Chinese, right? 
But then, you know, so that was the definition of me, foreign girl who can speak Chinese. But now there are so many foreign girls who can speak Chinese. So um, it's, it's been a bit, it's been, it's been humbling. And it's also um, pushed me to reevaluate well, what's making me special. Well, so on that note, I mean, what's the biggest lesson that you've taken from that? I mean, obviously, like, you're working as a white woman in China. You're American. There's already, you know, people are going to kind of shrink you into a category like yeah. what you just said, like, oh, foreigner speaking Chinese. You know, how interesting. So in, in kind of defining yourself now that it's more common and that you have room to sort of express your personal identity, not just mm -hmm. your appearance and nationality, what have you learned and how have you applied it to make yourself feel like you have this unique place, not just as you know, your, your passport. I think I've learned that in the world there are, there, there are many beautiful people, there are many beautiful people who are talented, but there's only one you. I, I can't do what they do, and they can't do what I do. You know, nobody can do what I do. So I've slowly, and it's still a work in progress, I guess slowly working up the confidence to just be different and sometimes be not that good, but just, you know, just, just be myself and this is, and this is me. and. And maybe in the next few years I'll get better at being myself and I'll have, and that's what people will want to watch. Aventurina plays a relatively rare role as a conduit of international dialogue and exchange in Mandarin Chinese language rather than English. As a result, she is able to communicate more directly her opinions as a foreigner of her home countries and of her experiences in China. On the side, she uses Twitter and video blogs to initiate discussion with her Chinese subscribers. Above all, living and working in China has taught Aventurina to see things from a different perspective, and as a result, she finds she is able to communicate more harmoniously with people, especially with her family, with whom in the past she had had a tenuous relationship. I think it's really important that you're doing this because, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's one more link between China and the rest mm -hmm. of the world, and you're representing that sort of middle point, but which is what might be kind of rare is that it's happening in Chinese language, whereas normally we see international, an international context tends to be in English, because yeah, English is true. the lingua franca, which in a way to me seems a little bit wrong, because obviously only a certain portion of the world's and population. Less the, and will, less than Chinese people. Exactly. There's more people speaking Chinese than people speaking English in the world. Exactly. Like, you know, even if you're fluent, only so many people can relate to the native experience of growing up in an English-speaking culture, so it's not totally addressing everyone's individual experience. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts about why it's important to kind of, I mean, I, I don't know if this is like too, too big to say, like you. Let's try it. But like you are connecting Oh, I can dumb down any West. question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, I can dump down everything. You know, but, but, but to me, you, you do serve in some ways a link between the East and West, and you're doing it in their language and in their cultural context, and that's incredible and different, and I think kind of necessary. Um, do you have any thoughts about why that's important? Sometimes I'm on TV. I, 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 I go and do interviews a lot on TV, and I talk a lot about my culture and, um, you know, w the way I view things, and, and people are always like, well, it's so... It's so surprising to me. I never thought a foreigner would think this way, or, or even 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 for them, it's 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 the way. It's. I think it's important. I think some things that they aren't proud about. Like I think it's so important for them, um, you know, to have a foreigner say, "This is amazing. This the the food is amazing. The culture is amazing." And I I think it's important for them at at this point to be, you know, to be affirmed also. Because there has been this tradition that's lasted for hundreds of years in China of looking to the West, looking to the West. And this is really the first time I think that Chinese people are like, well, no, we're awesome. And, uh, you know, economically, we're, we're a competitor to the United States now. Um, that's been great. I think it's also, I, sometimes I've done, I've done video blogs where I've talked about ways of thinking about, for, for instance, um, I went through this, this, this religious phase. I was talking about religion and beliefs and, um, and also talking about um, bo body images, you know, that there I've, I've been, um, I think I had a lot of, I went, I went, to, a, I went to do an audition on for, for a Chinese TV series and the director asked me to take off my shirt to look at how big my cup size was. And I didn't take off my shirt, but, um, you know, he sort of looked at it and he was like, oh, you're very, very flat for a foreign woman. And I went and I, and, I, and I did a blog about that. I don't think it's fair 
for a woman to be objectivized and to be so I don't I don't think it's fair for I don't I don't think that's okay so I think you know having a foreign woman speaking about these issues and I have a lot of young people who um, who look at my Twitter and and they were really also yeah you're right this is happening you know to me also and I'm I'm busy well it's in the works I'm writing a book about about um, about dating um, like my my dating rules as if I'm successful <laughs> in relationships but about about dating and I hope it'll also make um, make young young Chinese women uh, be able to see that it's not life is you know marriage and relationships are only a small portion of your time and life is really much more than having kids and you know giving everything to your husband yeah, um, I don't know that's that's a bit of a I'm sorry I wasn't no, no, hearing but, like... but I think the communication I think it's helpful for them to see what a foreigner thinks about China what a foreigner thinks about life and it's helpful also I represent my country I represent the states I represent France because I'm French also and that's and it's it's good for Chinese people to see while there's the we could be friends with an American citizen or a French citizen you know exactly so how do you feel like you've been most changed by this whole experience by China by working this way? I'd say I've been most changed with the way I communicate with people. I think it's helped me immensely in my in my communication in China and and Chinese people complain about living very tired lives because you're constantly thinking about what is that person thinking. For instance, very simple. I walk into the room. There's the head of the company his assistant, the second assistant, the head of a subsidiary, who do you talk first? When you want to raise a glass, who do you raise the glass to first? Do you raise, do you raise it to the person you have the best connection with? Do you raise it to the person who's the highest up? How do you define that? You know, where, do you, where, do you, where do you sit? What kind of jokes are, I mean, what are they going to, how do they see the situation? You, don't, you not only, when you walk in a room in China, you have to think about what does everybody think and I, I, there are so many examples of this and I, I could go on and on for hours but it's just so that's that's one of the things that I've become very aware of in my relationship with people is that how do I affect people if I say this what are they going to think if I say this what are they going to think so I become I, I think it's a good and a bad thing you become less spontaneous but maybe you become more accommodating easier to work around hopefully. Um, I think the other way it's changed me is my relationship with my parents and with my family. I've really, I really had a very tenuous relationship with my mother and with my father and with my sister um, because I'm from a, a divorced family and it's, you know, everybody goes through their things. Um, and I think that being in China, seeing how much Chinese people value family, seeing how much Chinese people put up with from their family, oh my god, there are there are Chinese women who are educated. They're getting arranged marriages. They have to listen to their mother for everything. They have to take care of their mother forever. They have to give money to their mother every month as soon as they're 21 or they're working. I mean, this is the way Chinese people treat parents. Um, and, you know, so it really, it really, really, I, I really felt very lucky that, that, you know, I can talk to my mother as a friend. Um, I have a lot to be thankful for, so that's definitely, and I've, I've made efforts to grow closer with my sister, and it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's wonderful being able to see things from a different perspective.